Hey guys, it's Fifth Lauren, also known as 944. Don't forget uh, Thorin's YouTube channel. When considering ways to enhance or progress the field of esports broadcasting, an obvious parallel to look at is the world of traditional sports broadcasting on television. Sure, many of the things that work for them only work for them in the context of their broadcast, of their publication model, which is very different from the esports one. But a lot of how they put together the team that produces the show has value in esports. And indeed, a lot of that is how we built out the broadcast behind the scenes and on camera teams for esports. So an area that exists in traditional sports broadcasts that I want to highlight now is the role which is invisible to everyone watching the broadcast. But if you know about the behind the scenes of a team, a broadcast team, you know it's essential that statsmen play in traditional sports. So when you're watching a traditional sports broadcast, could be the UFC, could be NFL, could be NHL, could be the English Premier League, Commentators come up with stats, cite them as they're talking, and weave them into the commentary to their pre-game analysis, their post-game analysis. So you might hear if you're watching a tennis tournament, oh, Roger Federer, of course, he's only completed four out of 13 break points in this game against Nadal. Historically, he gets half of his break points, an area lacking for the Swiss maestro so far. Maybe in the NBA, you might hear... Oh, LeBron, of course, only shooting 39% from that area on the left on the floor, as opposed to his traditional high percentage drive to the basket when he goes to his right. Maybe if you're watching the NFL, Drew Brees is a, the first quarterback in his career to set a, an X percentage completion rate for a season, topping the previous record by, I don't know who that would be in that particular sense. You get the point of the stats, right? The stat is something that ties into what's happening, gives you context for more than just the player, perhaps his career, perhaps the league average, perhaps the record for all of history, creates something you can discuss at this point in time and has relevance to what's happening. So it adds to people's experience of the game, gives them more salient information. So it helps add to a broadcast. It can drive discussion. The color commentator can come off that. Well, actually, of course, in this game, you know, they have been defending LeBron very much with his own defense, forcing him to his left. And, you know, there wasn't many options up. You know, he can add into that. He can play off that. He can and ignore it if he wants to. It helps frame what is happening. So you give the context, hopefully, of what's happening in the whole league or on the average so that you don't just have a, an interesting stat. It becomes more interesting by knowing the context of it versus their peers versus themselves historically. You can tie into that historical context. You can have a sense for where a guy's performance is, not just with your eye test now or the raw numbers in the score, but score box, box score now, the scoreboard now. You can also look at what they do elsewhere in past games. For the last four games, of course he's made at least nine free throws whatever it might be in that sense but those stats all come from someone who you're not seeing on camera this is someone sometimes a team of people where their entire job is they are dedicated just to finding those stats to make working up a dossier before the game of some of those stats for the commentators to use for the analysts to use if the commentators and analysts have a specific stat they can sometimes press the cough button send a message to the producer the producer gets the stats guy on it he comes up with the stat five minutes later they have the stat it all plays into what's happening and you Luckily, they're invisible because their job is to complement and enhance the rest of the broadcast. So in CSGO, I can already tell you so many people could use this sort of a person behind the scenes helping us out. Commentators, think about how many times they have downtime due to tech issues or a million pauses in a game due to technical timeouts, uh, tactical timeouts rather, or the delay from when they thought a game was going to go live and it's thrown to them, but it doesn't go live and they have to fill 10 minutes. This was where it would be so useful for these guys to have a dossier worked up, to have stats they could even request that they can then can talk around. They can then bring up and point out what's interesting about that. Give the context for it, tie it into something they were saying later, make some predictions based on it. This would be a great way to use up that time. Then you go over to the analyst desk. If you had some of these stats, how much easier would it be to use them within the context of how you're already going to frame a particular matchup between MIBR and Astralis, let's say? If you could say, well, you know, this team over here, I'm going to make up who's got these stats right now. Okay, Team Astralis, they have the best four versus five win rate. Even if they lose a man, they're winning the most rounds. But their opponent, let's say Na'Vi in this case, definitely wouldn't be Na'Vi probably, has the best opening kill frequency. I guess I'm thinking when I try and, and Na'Vi at uh, Simple Edge going absolutely ham. 
They have the best opening kill frequency, so we're going to see the matchup there. Which one of those factors wins out? Are Astralis the best team suited to overcome that? Is it actually better just to fight fire with fire and have your own best opening kill ratio at the beginning of round, then battle with that context? Be interesting to have that discussion, right? We don't have the stats to do it. You have to hope some analysts just observed something similar to that and makes a point vaguely along those lines. And you won't have the number on the screen to draw the eye in the same way. Likewise, if you could say, well, here are the stats of the star players of the two teams playing against the opposing core and when they specifically played on these maps and then versus their average on these maps when not playing against this specific opponent. Wouldn't that also be great info to notice? Oh, look, Phelps is actually having a harder time on overpass on CT side, specifically against Astralis, as opposed to when they played Na'Vi a few months earlier. This is all really interesting stuff to have. And if it isn't that interesting, you let it go by the by. You don't worry about it. You can keep talking about whatever you're talking about. That's one of the things about stats and highlights is when they throw them up on screen, it's up to the commentators and the analysts if they want to address them. If they don't, they keep talking over them. It's just something interesting to keep the eyes busy while you're listening to someone talk and vaguely tying in. Or if you want to nail it on that specific thing that you're seeing on screen, it's a great visual aid, isn't it? It's something that's very useful. So you could also use these stats to make unique points about the role and the impact a player has on his team or against a specific other team. So in Astralis, you'd obviously pick someone like Zipnix, right? How many clutches is he winning? How many of these clutches come from big time 1v3 type scenarios or simple 1v1s where he has similar health? How many come when the opponent has better equipment when they started with better utility in the round, does it lower his chances of winning the round? What about when he's against specific opponents? Are there certain opponents can just absorb losing three or four clutches to Zipnix? Are there some opponents that if they lose even one clutch to Zipnix, they just always lose the game to Astralis? This is interesting info to have because, again, analysts can give you their own version of this from watching the game. But first of all, they're not going to think of some of these discussion topics and they're certainly not going to be as precise as some of these stats would be. And even if they're going to make the point, giving them something Something tangible to claw onto or something to refer to on the screen and then some context that they won't have for the league average or something like that is going to make for potentially very interesting side information to go along with the point that they're trying to make. Now, yes, in theory, analysts can do this research themselves, but they can't really. Like, first of all, there is simply not the time to work up these kind of stats for a whole tournament. If you're doing a five, six day tournament with 16 teams, 12 teams, there's too many teams already there to do exhaustive research. It's 99% that you wouldn't get to use. Also, there's the fact that once the tournament's begun, you already have to commentate or analyze all day long. You don't have extra time on top of that to throw in three or four extra hours of work doing all this research. People don't know how much time that takes to do that research. Even to do a full workup of all the map stats for a team over the last three months can take like, uh, what, 40 minutes, an hour? That can be a big time deal. That's why once I've got them nailed, I just literally keep a track of it in my head then, add one, minus one, and I have a rough idea where I'm at because I live the map pool, so I know where these teams are at. There's a reason why some of my other people who I have on the desk are guessing that they're going to pick maps or play maps. That's like their second rotation band or something they only play against a certain type of team because they don't have these stats. They're having to go from memory. They haven't been able to dedicate as much time as I have to the map pool to every other aspect of the game, including the map pool. So the reason why you need the dedicated person is that's going to only be his job and you can go to him and make requests now you might think to yourself this is an entirely new role that didn't exist before who are we going to get to do this role there's already people who would do a really good job. I'll give you two off the top of my head. So Dust, Dust Moret, the guy you've heard doing commentary and doing analysis, I personally think he's a better analyst than a commentator anyway. But you know what? It's his career. He can choose whichever path he wants to take. If he enjoys doing commentary more, fair play, go for that. But if it's a massive event like a major where I'm going to go ahead and guess he probably wouldn't get hired as an analyst or a commentator, this will be a great role to hire him for. Dust is a guy who can go and do all this homework, who can do a big write-up. I've seen his notes before. He does a good job with them. He does his prep. He does his research. He knows where to look as well as what to look for. And he knows all the talent. He would be a great person to have in that regard and be able to just message like, hey, can you just look this up for me for the second map or whatever? Hopefully you pay him a decent day rate as well. And he gets to be a part of a major or a massive tournament. Another guy, a guy from the UK, actually, a guy called SEO. I worked with him at Gfinity. Also a guy who work, can work up all the stats, can do all this sort of stuff behind the scenes, has worked as an analyst, commentator at a lower level, would obviously jump at the chance to go to a higher level. So just as we needed dedicated observers, of course we do. Think of the tournament 
tournaments that don't have the big name observers, they're way, way worse. You think of the tournaments that do have them, yeah, they're invisible because you just enjoy the game, but you do notice when you think about other events, what a great job they're doing. Likewise, this sort of a person, a dedicated stats guy, could help enhance the role of everyone else. Now, that's the thing. It's not ever going to be a sexy job. You're not ever going to get super famous being the stats man, probably. I mean, we could help work it in. I know for other events, stats man Bruno, all that stuff in Dota 2. Listen, commentators Alice would give you your due. We'd give you a shout out. Just like Bardolf always shouted out the observers. I've always tried to give credit to people behind the scenes who are doing a good job. I think people would give you the odd shout out, but it's never going to be as sexy as being an analyst or a commentator. I get that. I totally acknowledge that. But it would add so much, in my opinion, to the broadcast. Because even though this would be an additional cost for the event for the TO, it's a complimentary one. It's one that enhances what you already have at the event. That becomes a catalyst to make the people you've already hired even better at their job and to make the broadcast even more enjoyable to watch, more interesting and more engaging. This video was generously supported by Dean Tanglis, Andreas Snazor westerland Butt Pounder 420, J Dobbs, Ho Chi Mao, Daniel Olivar, Jiang Hen Lu, Oli J, Tobias Bernasconi, Nate D O Double G, Alexander Rao, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my main man Jerky's minion. Now, do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my work? Maybe you want to ask me a question for my monthly AMA. Do you want teasers for who the guests are on my upcoming content? Maybe you want to take part in a monthly esports discussion with yours truly. Well, put your money where your mouth is and join the Scrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.